Welcome to another episode of Cadence Fishing TV. And I'm fishing today at the Meadowlands Fishery, which is near Coventry. It's a really fantastic mixed fishery. It's got a wonderful head of carp and a really good head of skimmers and roach. And it's those that I'm going to target today. And I'm going to use perhaps a different type of method to what would normally be used here, and that's a sliding bodied waggler. We recently shot a video about fishing with a bodied waggler on still waters. And this proved to be a really popular video and we generated a lot of comments and interest about it. And one of the subjects that came up was how to fish a sliding float or a sliding waggler. And that's a tactic that we're going to employ today. And it's a method that's not really used that much nowadays. In the past it was very, very popular method and one perhaps out of necessity before the advent of all the long pole tactics and feeder fishing that everybody uh, fishes with such effect today. But as we proved in the last video, fishing with a, a float on a still water like this is a tremendously enjoyable way of fishing. And even though it might not be the most efficient method, on its day it can be thoroughly enjoyable. So that's what we're going to have a go at today. One of the difficulties of fishing a waggler at range and a sliding waggler is when you're faced with windy conditions. And it's pretty windy today. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to feed two lines. I'm going to feed one line with ground bait around about 28 metres out. We've actually selected these pegs because we know we've got some good depth here and that's going to help us explain the sliding tactics for fishing a bodied float like this today. The other line I'm going to fish is around about 16 metres because gives me two options, two different feeding styles and also if the wind gets really bad we might end up fishing that closer line. So I just spent five or ten minutes just fishing on the long line, plumbing up. I've fired three or four balls of ground bait onto that line and I'm now going to plumb up on the closer line and I thought it would be interesting to show you how I do that with a slider. So as the name suggests, a slider float actually slides up the line. And I'll go into the details about the rig and how to set them up in more detail during this video. The advantage of using a slider is if you're faced with a deeper swim like we are today, on the long line I've plumbed up and I've found out there's around about 15, 14, 15 foot of depth. Now if I was to try and fish that with a fixed float, it would be very difficult and it would be extremely difficult to do it at range. And that's where the slider really comes in. It's a very positive method and that's because you're using a bulk of shot and the float is then sliding up the line and it's stopped by a stop knot. So basically you can fish any depth you want. You can fish, I would tend to fish a slider if I was fishing more than six foot and you could fish up to 30 foot for example using a slider float. I've set this around about 10 foot deep and I'm just going to cast it out just to try and understand what depth I've got on this closer line. So what's going to happen is the, the bolt's going to settle down through the line, slide down the line and get to the bottom. And obviously if the bolt hits the bottom, I know that I'm fishing too deep. Conversely, if the float settles like it has, I know that bolt shot now is still off the bottom. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to increase the depth by moving the stop knot up the main line. So it actually seems like there's not much difference in depth between the line out at 20 metres and this line around about 16, 16 metres. So I'm going to explain the process of how to cast and fish the waggler, but just quickly I'm casting past my proposed feed area, I'm sinking the line and bringing the float back to around about 16 metres and it's still not on the bottom. I think this way of plumbing up with a slider is much much better than trying to fish in the conventional way or plumb up in the conventional way with a plummet because it's going to be very difficult to cast the slider and the plummet out without it all tangling up and sort of cartwheeling out when you cast it out. It's going to make a big disturbance. And this way is actually a very accurate way of, of plumbing up. 
Right, so now I can see that float hasn't settled. So we know the bulk is on the bottom. In fact, the float's lying completely flat on the surface. So all I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna shallow up by around about a foot and I've got a good idea or a very accurate idea really of the depth that I'm fishing. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clip up so that I can fix the distance. I'm gonna clip up where I can cast a float very accurately and easily every time. And then I'm gonna clip up exactly the same as when you feed a fish in to fix the depth. And then I know when I sink the line, perhaps two or three turns, I'm back in position and we're fishing exactly the right spot and I know I'm fishing the right depth. I'll show you how to tie the stop knot for when you're fishing with a sliding float. So I'm going to take some line, in this case slightly stronger and thicker than my main line. So this is six pound pro gold. As I mentioned, the main line's four pound pro gold. And this is what I'm going to use to create the stop knot. I'm going to bite off around about a foot of that six pound line. And I'm going to use that to make the knot. And I'm going to, first thing to do is just make a loop. So I've got the two pieces of line in a loop. And I'm going to hold that against the main line. And then, it sounds complicated, but it isn't really. I'm going to take one of those tags and pass it around the other and the main line. So I don't know if Chappie can pick that up. But what it's doing is, I can, and I'm going to do that five or six times. Okay, so I've wrapped that round, a little bit like a, a half blood knot really. So I've gone six times round going away from the loop. Then I'm just going to simply put the tag end back through that and pull it together. And if you pull both sides of the nylon look, and just wet it. It makes a, a bit of a eight on the top. So if I just pull that together nicely, okay. That's the actual stop knot. And you can see that could move on the line and I can adjust the, how easy it is to move that by how hard I pull those two pieces together. And that's it. So it's a neat knot moves on the line without damaging it. And then what I'll do is, I'll cut the tag ends down. I won't cut them neatly to the line. I want to leave a tag, because that just helps the stop knot fire through the guides when you're casting out. And I'm gonna cut it to, I don't know, what's that? Four or five inches each side. If it's too long, I can just cut that down with time, but that's, that should work well. It's been working well today. Um, a good tip to mention as well is if you're finding that that is moving, maybe you're casting with a really big float, you're casting a long distance, you can actually put another granny knot into that to just secure it even more. And as I mentioned at the start of the video today, once you've plumbed up, you've got the idea of the depth. I like to just put a black marker on the clear green line to show exactly where I've plumbed up. And I think I'll just show you actually, because it's quite neat, because another benefit of it is, so if I just black out a section there, around about five or six inches, when you pull the knot onto it, you'll find that it will just grip nicely onto the ink from the, from the marker. And that won't move now. And I've also got a reference to go back to if I need to reset up my float or change to a different rig. Okay, I'm going to show you how I like to attach my hook length to the main line. And basically, I, th I think most people tend to call this the figure of eight knot. I referenced it in the last video, the bodied waggler video, and quite a pe few people asked how to tie it. So I'm going to show you and hopefully makes sense. So I've got my main line here and I want to attach a hook length and I'm just going to pull off 
the desired amount of hook length. Maybe a little bit longer than what you need to give you a bit of leeway. And so I've got the hook length and I pick the main line up and lie the hook length against the main line. So I think you can see that. I've just simply got the two lines laying parallel next to each other. Always wet it because that helps to stick the two bits of line together while you tie the knot and obviously reduce friction when you make the knot. And I'm going to pass both lines around two fingers. Okay, so I'm now trapping the line and I'm making this loop. And then with my right hand, I'm going to put my finger in the middle of that loop and I'm going to turn it around two times to create the figure of eight. And then, can you see, with my finger and thumb, I'm pulling the tag end and the rest of the hook length through. So I've actually created a true figure of eight knot. Can you see that? It looks a bit like a pair of spectacles. And what I'm going to do now is wet that and pull it together. And I reckon that that knot is the strongest knot and one that is so neat, it's going to bite off the tag ends and put them in my box. So what I've got there is such a neat junction between my main line and my hook length. It's super strong and very, very streamlined, very subtle. And nearly always I'll have my dropper shot buffered up against that knot. So in my mind, there's no better way to attach my hook length and achieve the best presentation. The main exception being where if I'm using a very short hook length, like when I'm fishing with bloodworm, uh, or I'm catching lots of small fish and I'll fish a loop to loop so I can change the hook length very quickly. But that's the, loop, the type of knot I use for the majority of the time for all my fishing. Okay, so I've put a hook length on that closer in rig now. And one thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a mental note of where the stop knot is in relation to the bulk. And basically, it's just below, if I'm holding the bulk on my keeper ring on the rod, basically, it's just by the tip. So, if I need to set up again, or I've got a reference for the depth. All right, let's get fishing.
into another fish and this does feel like a bream. Decent one as well. So fantastic fishery meadowlands and I don't tend to fish matches here although the, some of my friends do fish a lot of matches on here. It's a great venue, I love just to come and pleasure fish and caught right in the depths of winter. I like it because it's such a, this lake, such a big venue, it, it feels like a natural venue, it's obviously very well stocked with fish. But the bream and the roach, I think are here naturally, it's the, it's the carp that are heavily stocked. There we go, it is a bream. Nice one. Need my love one. Oh, that's fantastic. Two and a half pounds. Beautiful bream. And what a great start on the on the slider. I was expecting a few roach to start with, but looks like there's a few bream out there. It's taken the bait well down. So I'm pleased about that. It obviously shows that my bait's presenting well on the bottom, it's steady, and it's not moving too much in this strong wind. It's often a problem when you're fishing with a float at long range on the still water when you're faced with a windy day like this. And that's where the slider really comes in because the good bulk really helps to nail the bait on the bottom. I'm obviously not fishing the bulk on the bottom, the bulk's off the bottom, but it gets it down and it holds it near there. So at the moment, the rig's working really well. I had that one on a double red maggot on a size 18 hook, so I'm going to give that one another go. Other baits I've got with me today is uh, I've got casters, corn and worms, as well as live and dead maggots. So hopefully with time we should be able to work out what the best bait is and what the best type of feeding is. So I'm going to top up with another ball of ground bait. Got a bit of corn, castor and a few dead red maggots in. I've also mixed some micro pellets in as well, but we'll talk about that when we talk about the ground bait. Well, I'm into another fish. Don't think it's quite as big as that bream. Oh, it's a smaller skimmer, I think. Nice stamped fish there. About eight, eight to ten ounces, I think. And again, he's taken the bait well down. I was just thinking about introducing a bit of chopped worm, which I still think I might do. And obviously, a good amount of skimmers and bream out there, and obviously, chopped worm, such a devastating feed for them and I'll perhaps have one more go with a double dead red put some chop worm in and then try a worm a 
it's a lovely day despite that wind and the sun is just kind of moving round into the feed area where I am so it's not making it very easy to see the float but good job I've got my sunglasses on because I can still kind of look into the into the sun's reflection on the water and just about see my float but I guess in about half an hour it should have moved round enough so that I can see it perfectly again. It's obviously a consideration when you're fishing at long range with a float is just the ability to be able to see the float and I carry different floats for different situations. This one's got quite a thin top. If I was struggling to see it, I'd swap it over to a, a thicker top. Obviously with a thicker top, you haven't quite got the same sensitivity, so I'll stick with this one for a bit longer. Well that's a better skimmer, around about two pound. And I fed some chop worm in a couple of balls and I tried a slightly bigger hook, a size 14, with a worm head and a dead red maggot. So that seems to have done the trick. I had a nice period of about half an hour just catching skimmers between four ounce and a pound. I've just hooked a better bream now. Um, I think the, the chop worms definitely helped. And fishing with a, a big piece of worm, I think is helping me to target some better fish. I've tried um, double dead red and double caster and I was just getting missing bites really and getting some fast bites off small fish so I think worms been a, a good bait so far. I actually shallowed up slightly, I was fishing about a good foot, maybe two foot over depth and I shallowed up a foot so I'm still on the bottom but I, I did foul hook a couple of small skimmers so I wanted to try and get a, a better bite detection. It's working well, so what I think we'll do is I'll put a bit more bait in and we'll just have a look at the rig and explain some of the fundamentals about slider fishing like this. The rods I'm using today are all 14 foot. There are CR10 14 foot match rods and I've actually set three different rods up with different actions. Number one, two and three. The number one is the softest in the range, progressively getting more powerful as you go up to two and three. They've all got a nice fine tip and a really good progressive action, which is really essential when you're fishing with a, a float at range like we are today, and certainly when you're using a, a bodied waggler. 
The extra length just makes the job so much easier in terms of casting the rig out and also picking up the line and striking. The reason I've set up three different versions of the 14 foot is that I can use different types of floats, different types of slider floats on each rod. And we'll talk about that when we look at the actual rigs in more detail. The reels I'm using, I've matched the rods up with a CS5 4000, which is a perfect reel for this type of fishing. The slightly bigger spool really helps, again, when you're casting longer distance, just makes the job much easier. And they've got a 6.1 to 1 gear ratio, which also helps when you're fishing at range. Okay, let's have a look at the rigs that we're using for slider fishing today. This rig is the rig that I'm using on the closer inline, which is around about 20, 16, 20 meters. And it's a traditional type of slider float, which I can probably show you better here. These are actually handmade. I've had them for years and I really love them. There's no loading in them at all. Um, and you've actually got whipped on the bottom there, this slider eye, which has got a very, very fine diameter eye. And they just work tremendously well. They've got a balsa body, peacock stem, and then a cane insert. And the whole balance of them for me just works so well. My kind of thinking with most my slider fishing is, I like to have my float running on top of the bulk. There's some rigs you can utilize where you've got a shot above the bulk and the float will rest on that during the cast. And I think they use best when you're using a semi-loaded float. I like using an unfloated float or a slightly loaded float and I'll rest it on the bulk because I find I get the least amount of tangles with that kind of rig. So as with most float rigs, certainly when you're fishing at range, you need the rig to be very, very simple. So you can see here, this, is a, this float has a capacity of around about 4 AA. Um, I've got three AA bolt together, I've got some BB shot around it, and I've got some number eights. So I've got the vast majority of my weight capacity in that bulk. And then down at the moment, I've just got four number eights as a dropper shot. It's a positive rig and it needs to be, particularly when you're fishing further out and in the wind like this, you need to be able to cast the float and know that it's not tangled. As soon as you start spreading shot out or using more fancy shotting patterns, you'll find that you'll just get loads of tangles. Believe me, I've tried it and learnt from my mistakes. One thing that's really important to talk about with all the slider rigs is the actual main line that I'm using. I'm using this 4.4 pound Pro Gold which has a diameter around about, well, 0.20. And that might seem quite heavy, but again, when you're slider fishing, it really seems to help reducing tangles. If you try and fish with a bit more finesse, fish a lower diameter mainline, you just get trouble. So I think this stiffer, thicker mainline really helps fishing the slider. So in that situation, obviously, that floats resting on the bolt when I cast. When it gets out to the into the swim, the bulks pull that and the float rises up and stops against the stop knot. Dead simple. The other two floats that I'm using, because I'm fishing further out, I'm using a bigger capacity float and I'm actually using a slightly loaded version. As you can see, this is a, a Drake float it's six and a half AA in capacity. I've used a float adapter in this case, and you can see there's a little brass insert at the bottom of the float that just provides a little bit of loading. And I like that because when you really are forcing a cast to go that extra distance, again, that float just sits nicely against the bulk and it doesn't come away from the bulk until the floats hit the water and that bulk slides the float up like the previous version. On this one, you'll see that I've got a bead here, a small bead situated above the quick change adapter. Obviously, the big advantage of these quick change adapters is you can change the float very easily if you want to change the, the color of the tip or maybe you want to change to an insert from a straight. 
you can do it no problem. And that simply, that bead, all that does is enables the stop knot to stop the float. If I didn't have that bead there, that eye would go over the stop knot. So that's the reason we've got that free running bead above it. Now this, this float that I'm using here is a balsa body again, and this has got a peacock stem. And it's a straight peacock stem. And obviously that's giving a slightly thicker tip, which will help you see the float when you're fishing at range, particularly when you've got bad light conditions. This different version here, which I've set up on my other rod, is a similar bodied waggler, very, very lightly loaded with a brass insert at the bottom but it's actually got a thinner insert in the tip. And I like to use that perhaps if I'm using smaller baits, like maggots, casters, catching smaller fish like roach, but I've got a fish at range. So I need the capacity of the float to get it out comfortably to where I'm fishing, but I've got a bit more sensitivity. So that to me is the fundamental requirements of my slider floats. They're going to be bodied 90% of the time because most of the time I'm going to be fishing past the pole, I'm going to be fishing at distance and I'm going to be fishing with a positive rig with a decent bulk. Hooks and hook lengths on the rigs today. Started off using this 0.11 Vest Pro and I matched that up with a 18 Drennan F1 hook. Obviously barbless. It's it's barbless hooks here at uh, Meadowlands. Then when I switched over to a bit bigger baits like the Wormhead, I've gone to a size 14 F1 hook and I've upped the hook length to 0.136. So I guess that's around about a three pound hook length. So the ground bait I've used is I've used a third of Special G, which is a fish meal ground bait. My thinking there is Meadowlands is fished by a lot of carp fishermen, people targeting the carp with pellets. So I think that the silverfish like the bream and the roach are accustomed to it. And I think that's a very effective additive. I've also mixed in a third of this pro feeder ground bait. I know we're not fishing the feeder, but I really like this. It's a, it's a nice fluffy mix, it's got lots of big particles, lots of food content and obviously we're fishing in the autumn now, the fish are feeding so I'm not worried about overfeeding them and I want to attract and hold as many fish as I can. The other third is pure brown crumb that I buy from Lanes and I mix it, when I mix the water I add this molasses and I think that's a really good tip because it adds sweetness to the mix but also, and more importantly for me, when I'm fishing this like this and I'm firing balls of ground bait out, it makes the mix a little bit stickier. 
and you can see there that's the neat ground bait on its own um, it's quite a it's quite a coarse mix with all those particles we talked about and it's one that I can just squeeze and make a ball very easily and very quickly and it, it's also a mix that I can add lots and lots of particles and that's what I've done today so it's it's sticky enough to hold lots of particles without breaking up when I fire the balls out that's the fishery micro pellets that I've dampened down and what I've actually been doing is I've been putting a lot of these in with my ground bait and this is a trick I like to do a lot when I'm fishing for skimmers and bream because I think they absolutely love those micro pellets so you can see there there's a good mix of, of the ground bait with the micro pellets and then I'm adding a good handful of casters the reason I'm not doing this with all the ground bait at the start of the session is, is probably obvious but what will happen is the mix will dry out all those pellets will absorb and basically the casters will start to turn so what I do is I, I tend to make up batches like this perhaps every hour or hour and a half to ensure that everything's all fresh and absolutely perfect for, for feeding. I've also been putting in some dead maggots. I've got a mixture of white and red dead maggots that I froze. And I'm keeping them in water to stop them from sort of decomposing during the day. So they're nice and fresh as well. And by not using too wet a ground bait, it means that I can add all these ingredients without the ground bait then becoming too wet and not being able to hold together. And as you know, so far this session, I've added some chopped worm in. And of course, if I added the chopped worm in, that would add even more moisture. But that now makes the perfect ball. So just one squeeze like that, it all holds together. And my process for, for feeding with the catapult is, I literally, because I want to be consistent with the size of the ball that I'm firing out so that they're going pretty much the same spot every time. I try to grab, in fact, what I'll do is I'll put it in the actual tray that I use. So I've got that in my side tray. With my left hand, I can just take one handful. So it's going to be the same size every time. And all I'll do is I'll perhaps just quickly mould it into a ball or slightly elongated ball like that and that goes perfectly into the cups of these ground bait catapults that I'm using. So I'm firing out a good ball that's very very consistent in size and also isn't going to break up in flight. So I referenced the pouch, I better talk about the different catapults. I've actually got three catapults today and this is the one that I've settled on at the moment. It's actually got a fairly short but powerful catapult elastic and I really like it because once I've got the direction that I'm going to feed I can by pulling the catapult the same distance every time it's obviously going to fire the ball the same distance every time. So I actually quite like a short elastic like that so I'm not stretching the elastic too far back and giving myself variation on the distance. Having said that, I have got these, I bought these two new Drennan catapults, which I really like, and they supply them with different strength elastics. That one is designed for fishing 20 to 30 meters. That one's designed for fishing 30 to 40 meters. So I like that concept. I think it's really good because obviously once you've decided the distance you're gonna fish, you can then choose the right catapult to accurately feed the balls of ground bait and the size of the ball of ground bait. On a harder day, I might use half the size of one of those balls. And obviously a smaller ball like that, given the same pressure, is gonna fire further than a bigger, heavier ball. And just finally on the ground bait catapults, just wanna mention the actual pouch that we're using and it's a great pouch when you're firing out softballs of ground bait like this. I suppose it's more like a nugget really and quite often I'll, I'll use that shape rather than a round ball. So it just fits in the in the pouch perfectly and is very very efficient. The old style round kind of 
ground bait poults, pouches. I tend to use if I'm firing a big ball out, um, but they don't tend to fire this kind of softer ball out very efficiently at all. I just tried double red maggot and had a smaller skimmer so I'm going to go back onto a piece of worm and I'll just take you through the casting process and how to actually fish with the slider float. So, As you can see the wind's got up now it's really quite strong but I'm still managing to hit the distance that we started at around about 20 metres out, 28 metres out rather. Just by ensuring that I've got a big enough capacity flow on. Okay, so the way I'm going to cast is obviously an overhead cast and I'm not going to try and force the cast too hard because when you, if you do a really powerful strong cast you can find that you get a really bad tangle. What I'm sort of aiming to do with this slider is cast it a bit higher, make sure that I get to the clip or at least feather the line so that the rig lands in a straight line and then we can begin the process of explaining how to fish it after that. So there's the cast, it's a powerful cast but it's not an aggressive cast. I'm using both arms to get the flow out and the distance required. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sink the line now just by putting the tip right under the water and doing two or three turns of the handle. Now the float's popped up and you can see that it's sitting proud of the water as the line and the bulk goes through the float. And what I'm having to do to ensure that happens where the float is, is I've actually got the bail arm open. So whilst the bulk is settling through the float, line's actually peeling off the spool. And I've got the line well sunk, and you'll notice that when I'm holding the rod, I'm actually keeping the rod really deep under the water today because obviously this wind would catch the line and drag the float off course. So now the bulk's settled, I know the dropper's settled, and we're waiting for a bite, the float's in position. And this is the distance that I'm feeding the ground bait. So I'm not obviously firing the ground bait out past the float. So once everything's settled, I've sunk the line, the float's in position, that's when I'm going to fire the ground bait. I'll just do it for you now. Well, I don't know if you could see that, but that bite was actually a lift bite. So what's happened is the fish has obviously lifted my dropper shot up and the float's actually slightly lifted out of the water. And a lot of the bites I've had have been like that today. And that kind of just shows how important it is to fish with a, a positive dropper like that. Just makes reading the bite so much more easy. I've had a, a good run of those fish, the skimmers are around about six ounces, eight ounces. It's absolutely wonderful sport, I'm really enjoying it. It's definitely a challenge fishing a, a slider like this, particularly on a windy day, but it's given me so much pleasure and making me think I should do it a bit more often. Well, best bait today, certainly for the bigger skimmers, has been using a a bit of worm. I've been using the, the head of a, a dendrobina worm, quite a decent chunk. And I like to just thread that on like that. And then I'm just tipping it off with a dead red maggot just to sort of prevent the worm from doubling over the hook. And there you go. I think 
whenever I'm feeding chopworm, I love fishing bits of worm like that. Seems to really work well. That's got to be similar to the bits of worm that we're feeding. So the fish obviously get accustomed to taking it. A nice tip today for you is, obviously that, that float, that rig's all settled nicely. And maybe if I've not had a bite for a minute or so, I just like to just twitch it back just by turning the handle. And what I'm doing is I'm just moving the, the float and the hook bait just to a slightly different spot. Because obviously when I'm feeding like this with a catapult and balls of ground bait, you're feeding as accurately as you can, but you're going to spread the bait out. I think we've got a bite there now. Oh, I missed it. But it proves the point. What, what I was trying to say was, obviously you're not going to feed everything on a really tight area. You're going to probably spread the feed out around about, a, I think a sort of five meter circumference. And just by moving the, the float and hook bait through that area, you could even either attract a fish or maybe the fish has already got the bait in the mouth, certainly when you're fishing over depth and you register a bite. You can see though, even though it's really windy again at the moment, that floats holding in position perfectly. We've actually noticed that the, the undertow today is basically going left to right, which is pretty much opposite the, the wind direction. And it's obviously really key to at least have the float and hook bait holding in position on the bottom. Any bait that would be moving with the wind, I think would be just totally ignored. It just wouldn't be behaving naturally. There we go. That's another fish. That was a good classic bite. That just disappeared there. So perhaps fishing a feeder today maybe would have been a more productive method in terms of the total weight caught, but I've had tremendous sport catching some really nice quality fish on the slider. Well, I've had over 30 pound of beautiful skimmers on the slider. Bit of a forgotten method, but one that I've thoroughly enjoyed using today, and I think you've enjoyed it as well, haven't you, Mont? Right, let's get them back. Thanks for watching.